Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. Jessica Turner is the founder of the popular lifestyle blog, The Mom Creative, where she documents her pursuit of cultivating a life well-crafted. You can find her at themomcreative.com. She is the author of The Fringe Hours, Making Time for You and Stretch Too Thin, How Working Moms Can Lose the Guilt, Work Smarter and Thrive. She lives with her three children in Nashville, Tennessee. Jessica, we are so excited you would join us today. It's so fun to get to talk to you. I feel honored and a little scared because I think that you two are some of America's greatest voices for parents. And so I'm just so thankful that you would want to invite me to your living room, so to speak. Well, we've had this mutual fan club going for a long time then because you and I in the last year have developed this friendship over Instagram, which is one of my favorite things about social media. Before that, we spoke at a MOPS conference with you. Do you remember this? I do. It was Mm -hmm. a long time ago. It was like six years ago. And we tried so hard to connect in person because we were so excited to be speaking at this event with you because we thought the world of you. And then our schedules, we were all speaking in different hours or something, and we didn't get to connect. But we feel the same way. And you do this amazing job of equipping moms and people. I can't even name all the things that you help people learn and discover and things that you connect people with. But through all of it, there's this voice of encouragement and humanity and grace Mm. and coming alongside. That's the phrase that kept coming to my mind when I was thinking about you this morning, that you just come alongside people in such a beautiful way and make all things, whether it's truth or shopping or anything, you make it so accessible. Thank you. So we are so grateful for your voice and honored for you to spend time with us. Thank you so much. It's so important for me, whether it's people following me on Instagram or I know them in real life, that they feel like I'm their girlfriend. Mm. You know, like I'm the girlfriend who knows all the things, who's telling you like it is. I'm an Enneagram 8, so I'm always just going to shoot straight. So that means a lot because that is really important to me. When did you first know that you wanted to step more into a place of encouraging other working moms? I think it was just really natural. So I started blogging in 2006. I am an OG online, a mommy blogger before I was (laughs) even a mom. So my site is called The Mom Creative. At that time, I was on Blogger. It was the life, faith, and creativity of Jessica Turner. And I just loved having conversations with people online. I started out talking about crafting and scrapbooking in particular. I was really big in memory keeping at the time. And so that was kind of how it started. And so then when I became pregnant in 2007, I just started, you know, talking about my journey as a new mom and what should I do here? And here's what's working for me. And I remember I did a post Gosh, it was probably 2009, maybe 2010, talking about being a working mom. So I've always worked full time. And that's something that I feel called to do, something that I have a lot of purpose in. It's honestly something that we need for our family's bottom line for me to work. And so I've always talked about that. But I remember that one post really hit a nerve with people. And people were on, you know, two very different sides of the fence about, you know, my kids were going to be hurt by the fact that I was working and go Mm. you, I work too kind of thing. And I just really remember leaning into that and leaning into the conversation, being hurt by some of the comments, of course, but knowing that I felt really called to share my story 
and share my journey and hopefully encourage other women along the way. And then a few years later, I wrote a book called The Fringe Hours, Making Time for You. And it was a book for women about the importance of self-care and making time for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to write a book ever. I am recently divorced, but at the time, my husband, full-time writer, and I thought he was the only person (laughs) that was going to write books in our family. That was not Mm -hmm. my thing. And it really felt like an act of obedience. I don't tend to spiritualize a a lot, but that felt like this was something that the Lord wanted me to do. And so working full-time, two kids, I was writing a book at five in the morning and on weekends, getting that out because I felt like women really needed to hear the message that they mattered and their passions Mm -hmm. mattered and that that was something that a lot of women were really leaving out of their lives and it needed to be a part of it. And so I think the birth of the fringe hours and that message really kind of took things to another level for me in terms of understanding my purpose and really wanting to lean into that encouragement for women. That was a really long answer. I'm sorry. No, but I love that. (laughs) I love for folks to hear that. And we've been talking a lot lately in the season about balance, and you're alluding to that already. But what would you say you feel like balance looks like or even why is it important for a working mom particularly? So I'll be honest with you. I hate the word balance. And I always tell my kids, don't (laughs) use the word hate. We don't want to, that shouldn't be part of our vernacular, but hate is really the only word I can use for that because I don't think that balance is something that is ever achievable. And Mm. I think that we are reaching for something that we can't have. Mm. I read a book once by a man named Matthew Kelly, and he talked about work-life satisfaction. And so the balance word comes up a lot because I speak to working moms a lot in that work-life balance. And so I don't think about balance so much as I think about satisfaction or happiness or just how is everything feeling? Because I think things can look like they're really balanced. Everything can fit on the calendar calendar perfectly. You can get from point A to point B and all of this fits, but inside we feel gross and we're overwhelmed and we, or we don't want to do something. We over yes ourselves. And so I think for working parents to recognize, am I feeling satisfied in all of these different areas? Are my kids happy? You know, are we running to too many activities? I was talking to a mom recently and her kids are little, like five and seven. And she has her girls in gymnastics and swimming and voice lessons and acting and all of these things. And she was like, what do you do with your kids? I'm like, in our house, we are one activity house because if we're doing too many activities and we're go, 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 there isn't space to create and just be and have some downtime. And even though all those things fit fine on her family's calendar, I was like, how are you feeling about doing all that? Like, are you enjoying that? Do you remember anything from when you were five? Because I don't. Like, they're not even going to remember those things. Like, (laughs) back off a little bit. So I don't know if that's true for everybody or, you know, what you all would have to say about that. But I think thinking about kind of what is your satisfaction in Mm -hmm. your life? And that's going to, I think, speak into if there are any changes that you need to make. Now, that's not to say that certain seasons aren't going to be busier. There's certainly busier seasons for me at work or when I'm on a deadline. But generally speaking, how do I feel like things are in my relationship with my kids, with my work, with myself? And if I'm feeling good in all those things, then I think we're humming along at a a decent pace. And and there's a balance, if you will, if you want to call it that. But I don't like to call it that. (laughs) It's great. That is great. Yes. You have been incredibly generous in sharing your story as a single parent. What are you learning in this season about parenting that you would want to share with other single parents? I think I would remind single parents and parents, honestly, in general, is that it isn't the quantity of time with your kids. It's the quality of that time that you spend with your kids. And I would say this a lot when I was married, but I was working outside the home. And, you know, I had that hour and a half in the morning and a couple hours at night, and that was all that I had with my kids. But what really matters is that my kids, when I'm present, when I'm with them, that I'm really with them. And that has become even more apparent to me as a single mom where my kids are not in my house. I'm not tucking them in every single night. But when I am tucking them in at night in my house, I really try to 
<sighs> not sigh because there's one more <laughs> glass of water, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and there's some nights where I don't get it right, but really trying to be intentional and really present. Or if I can't be present because I'm having to do something else, that I let them know that. And that then I say, okay, I can't listen to that story right now because I'm doing this, but give me 15 minutes and then I want to hear it all. And I want to sit with you and hear it all. Mm. I've learned that if I manage my kids' expectations, that's all they really need. Mm. They don't need the 24-7 constant. They just want to know that when you are with them, you're with them. For some parents, that might mean putting down the phone. Or for some other parents, that might mean not starting that Netflix show until the kids go to bed. And there's lots of different distractions that we all have. And so I think it's about that quality time instead of that quantity of time. And in the research that I did for my second book, Stretch Too Thin, I found that to be true. And you all probably know that in your own work, that that quality time is what really makes a difference. And I've seen that even more so play out in our story now having two separate homes that that quality time really, really matters. Yes, I would so agree. I feel like I've been saying to parents lately, just 10 minutes, 10 minutes a day that is totally focused on your child. And that really will make a profound difference. So yeah, I love that you're saying that. We are so thrilled to be partnering with our friends at Minnow to bring back the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. We all know that devices are here to stay. So if you want to make screen time meaningful for your kids, Minnow is for you. A new streaming service designed just for kids. Minnow has over 2,000 episodes of fun and faith-filled shows that have been carefully curated by moms, dads, and church leaders, so it's safe for your family. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominno.com to start your free trial. I remember a story Glenn and Doyle shared early in the pandemic, and parents were freaking out that their kids were having too much screen time. And she yes. said, you know, I was a teacher. And here's the most important thing. You start the day and end the day well. <laughs> and what happens in the middle is going to still be okay, even if they had a lot of screen time. If you have that really great quality story time, or you have that one great moment going play at the park or something, that, you know, it's going to be okay. And I think that was a relief for a lot of parents. And I think there's truth mm. in that, having those quality moments, even if every moment isn't quality. Yes, absolutely. Well, okay, so thinking about quality and thinking about coming up on summer, which is when this is going to air, what have you learned uniquely that you'd want to share with other working parents about the summer? Because it gets especially tricky in a lot of ways. Oh, we are in the thick of figuring all of that out, and it does get tricky. I'm very practical. So a couple things that are really work well for us is like we do subscription crates, you know, so they've got activities that they can kind of do on their own. I'm a big planner, no surprise, as an eight. And so I like to give the kids just like a lay of the land. Okay, so mommy is going to work today. And while I'm working, I want you guys to do these things. And then I'm going to take a break at lunch, and then we're going to do this. And then in the afternoon, let's focus on these things. And kind of having some points that they know that if they accomplish those things, then they can be rewarded with free time or screen time or, you know, whatever the case is. But I think going into every day with some sort of expectations is really helpful. It doesn't have to be as regimented, of course, as during the school year. But still having those parameters, I find that that makes for less stress for me working from home and a better day for them. Now, that's not to say that every minute is planned or that I think it is not okay for kids to be bored. I think it's great for kids to be bored. And I think there's a lot of learning that happens when you're bored. We actually, this April, did No Screens April. We're recording this in April, so I don't know wow. if it worked the whole month. But I can tell you <laughs> that we're off to a good start. And, you know, like I just felt like everyone needed a little bit of a detox. Matthew and I both felt that way. And it's been really good. There's been a lot more creativity, a lot more card games happening. And so I just enjoy that opportunity for the kids in summer. My kids are six and a half. And then this summer, my older two will be 13 and 10. Mm. There's some gap in there. So that can be tricky. So arranging for play dates as you feel comfortable with the pandemic and, and trying to do a couple things as a family in, interspersed in there. You know, I, I often find that taking just one day off periodically makes as big of an impact as having a week long vacation. 
Mm. It's so great. True. Yeah. You mentioned the word creativity in answering that question. You are brilliant with mm. creativity with yes, your you kids. Are. And and even as we're thinking into summer, what are some of your favorite things you've done with your kids over past summers that other parents could do too? Our favorite thing to do at the start of summer, and this is perfect for when this is airing, is we create a bucket list every summer. And it has looked different in different years, but essentially what it is, is it is a list of things we want to do in the summer. These are our must do's. I've actually got a really fun printable posters for families on the momcreative.com slash bucket list. But the idea is super simple. Everybody says what they want to do. You write down Maybe the best ideas or the ones that are doable. I mean, Disney World might not be an option, but, you know, having a Disney day is certainly a lot easier, Uh, whatever, right? And so write down those ideas. I've got 12 that I think is kind of a nice round number. You know, it's like one or two a week that you shoot to do. And if those things get done, then you feel like pat on the back. I did it. And I think, you know, so often we get overwhelmed by what we're seeing on social media that like to have the perfect summer, we have to have the beach vacation, we have to have Disney, we have to have the perfect matching bathing suits and all of the things. And (laughs) my kids are like, I want to do a slip and slide and I want to do water balloons and I want to go to every park in Nashville or, you know, like whatever. Mm. And there's simple, simple, simple things. And I think just sitting and not feeding our kids ideas, but letting them come up with those ideas makes for a really memorable summer for them Mm. and makes it a lot easier on the parents. Because when you're like, I don't know what to do. Well, let's look at what we put on the bucket list and see if we can do one of those things. So I think that is first and foremost. The second thing, you know, we always buy art supplies at the start of the school year. And so our kids come home from school at the end of the school year and all their crayons are shot and their markers are shot. I like to get a lot of new art supplies at the beginning of the summer so that those can really be enjoyed throughout the summer. We also love, there's a couple of great YouTube channels that teach your kids how to draw. One is called Art Hub for Kids. And my 13-year-old and my six-year-old will sit and draw the same character. And I think that is amazing for them to be able to do something together, to be doing something creative. They're both getting something out of it. You know, participating in library programs, I think, is really great to just encourage reading. My kids are kind of varying in their passions for reading. With both of their parents being authors, they have no choice, but really they're going to read every summer, lots of books. And so participating in some of those reading programs and setting goals and incentives, you know, like an ice cream date or something like that makes reading a big part of our summer as well. I want to hang out at your house for the summer. Me too. (laughs) It maybe sounds more fun in small bites. There's a lot of boredom, but there are a lot of books (laughs) and a lot of craft supplies. So (laughs) yes, and a lot of water balloons. (laughs) And we're going to put a link to all these great things you've talked about in the show notes, including what you talked about with your bucket list, because we want people to have access to that for sure. So, okay, if you were going to kind of step back and think about just parenting in general and these little people that you love in your house, if you had to say three truths that you want them to know, what would you say those are? I want them to know, first and foremost, that they're always safe. Mm. that I'm a safe place for them to come, that they can always come to me with no judgment, no fear. I think my kids feeling safe is something that is deeply, deeply important to me. I also really want my kids to know how full of light they are and that that light has tremendous value and purpose and that they get to shine that really brightly in their own unique ways, that their light is something to be celebrated and something to be shared. And then the last thing I want them to know is that they're never alone because God is always with them, mm-hmm. that no matter where they are or whose house they're at or if they're at school, um, that they never have to feel alone because God is with them. I think those are three truths mm-hmm. that are really important to me mm-hmm. and to their dad. Great truths for all of us to remember. Uh, yeah. Thank you. so true. Mm-hmm. Jessica, if you were to decide to be open to letting us hang out at your house this summer (laughs) and create our own bucket list, we would both say eating a lot of tacos would be at the top of that list. We'd like to eat tacos with you. Good, good. And we love to end our conversations in that space, and we want to know what's your favorite taco. 
Gosh, that's so hard. So I'm doing (laughs) WW right now. And so my Mm. favorite taco is not a taco I'm eating right now. So my favorite taco is a hard shell taco. But I'm doing Mm. a lot of soft shells because those are only one point. And the hard shells are a lot of points. (laughs) So I'd say a hard shell taco with guacamole and sour Mm. cream and probably beef Mm. over chicken. I'm sorry, this is probably painful to talk about. I'm going to really splurge. I mean, I still have tacos every week. I'm just doing more chicken than beef. Yeah. Soft shells. You know, I'm just trying to be better. And, you know, I think that's something that's really important. I'm going to actually end there instead of with tacos. I'm going to just preach here for one more minute for a mom that might need to hear this. It is really important for our kids to see us modeling healthy behaviors. Yes. And so... I think about how when my kids know that I'm doing WW, which I am doing because my doctor said my body was not as healthy as it should be. And so I made some changes to my diet, and I'm so proud of how far I've come. But for my kids to be joining me in that and knowing that, you know what, mommy's going to do this instead of this because this is a healthier choice. Or mommy is going to not work late tonight because it's more important for me to hang out with you. And then when you go to bed, I'm going to read a book for an hour because that brings mommy a lot of joy. We shouldn't be hiding our self-care from our kids. It's so important that our kids see healthy habits and see us modeling good self-care habits so that when they go into adulthood, they're not thinking they need to work themselves to the bone, that they're not thinking that they shouldn't have time away from their kids or whatever that may be because they saw their parents doing that. So. My kids are seeing me eating healthy tacos right now, but they also are seeing me have an occasional chocolate chip cookie because everything in moderation, right? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Mm. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It just feels like, I mean, I think even that idea of coming alongside, I mean, I think you've done it again just in this conversation and how I feel like it just feels like parents have never needed those messages more. I mean, the degree of exhaustion they feel and overwhelmingness. And so those reminders of self-care and what it looks like to not only speak it into your kids, but to be modeling it in front of them. And yeah, I'm just so grateful for your voice and heart and creativity and sharing all of it with us. It's fun to spend time with you. Oh my goodness. I feel like I talked too much. I know know you said that's the point of the podcast is to be interviewed, but I love (laughs) listening to you all so much and your wisdom. And I'm just grateful for your leadership in this space. It's really meaningful work. And I know I have thousands of followers who have said thank you to me when I share your content. Mm, Thank you. Thank you for that. so much. You're awesome. Yes, you are. Thanks, y'all. You tell too. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family, which shows kids love and values parents' trust. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.